I'm Joni Carley. I'm a fellow here at Global Dialogue Institute. And before we get going with the program, as Ashok was talking about this being the 17th year, I thought, you know, it's about time, isn't it? It's about time that this really comes to fruition. We've all been thinking and talking, and I just want to get that in the air and in the space right now. So think for a moment, what is it time for? In your world, what is it time for? And share that with your neighbor. What do you think it's time for? Just take a moment. Great. Thank you. So I have the wonderful pleasure of introducing Dr. Ashok Gangadeen. Ashok has so many accolades, it's almost hard to know where to begin. He's been here as a philosophy professor for over 40 years, and he is, uh, he's speaks around the world at all kinds of conferences. He has published quite a few books, including a six CD set called Awakening the Global Mind. And throughout his career, Ashok has been demonstrating that human reason is global, it's holistic, it's dialogic, and it's intercultural in its scope and in its power. Ashok is a pioneer on the frontier of new thought. He's a pioneer in global reason, global ethics, and global wisdom. His work clarifies and excavates the common ground among widely diverse worlds, cultures, ideologies, and disciplines. It's truly time now that we have great consciousnesses like Ashok who opens up the conscious space and opens up, dilates the dialogue here in this area for us. And it's, the college has recognized that it is time to elevate this to a whole new place. And it's my privilege and honor to announce to you today that Ashok now sits in the Emily Judson and John Marshall Guest Professor of Global Philosophy Chair. This is a high honor in the university. It's a great movement in the world of academia to open up a chair. Think of the foresight that the college has to open up a chair for this space. And it's all because of the work that Ashok has done all of these years that has dilated the space and created the culture, created this space in the world of academia and in the world at large. It's my pleasure to introduce Ashok Gangadeen. Thank you, John. <clears throat> uh, what I'd like to do, uh, you know, just in the spirit of opening up the space for what we are doing here, I'm going to end up going on the spa stage to that uh, pad because I don't have a PowerPoint. I create the PowerPoints as I go on, on the, uh, in the old-fashioned way to give you a visualization in the, pr in the spirit of a meditation. So don't think of this as a lecture, please. It is a meditation attempting to enter into uh, the dilated space, the deep space of global wisdom. And the word, even the word global wisdom, uh, as I understand it, and I've been serving it for decades, is recognizing that if we step back from whatever cultural lens we were groomed in all our lives, even in utero, and we, that's our culture, that's our worldview, that's how we see reality. And most of us don't need, aren't educated to be clear that we have a lens of the mind. And the lens colors everything we see and how we relate or don't relate to everything around us. And, if we, and so we tend to live our lives in that space and not even realize we're constrained and constricted. And philosophers have called that in all kinds of ways, uh, depending on how you are. Plato said that humans are living in the cave and they're seeing the shadows on the wall and uh, the journey of philosophy, which means philosophia, the lover of Sophia, the infinite feminine wisdom that's the source of it all, out of which all our worlds uh, arise, because it's infinite. That's infinite wisdom. That's what philosophy is, lover of Sophia. And the lovers of Sophia to step out of the cave into the light. That's what Plato saw and Socrates, that the journey of philosophy is leaving the cave, breaking the shackles, and going into the light and then it's terrifying the thought of going back in, but then you have to.
because that's the philosopher, is uh, if to the extent that he, she enters a light, to go into the cave to serve humanity because that's you in the cave, uh, to, to bring the light is going to, you're going to stumble when you come back all the more, you're going to be disoriented and so forth. That's just Plato and Socrates as heroes of a European tradition. But if you can step back from whatever lens we have, or even complex lenses, and we may have complex lenses as everyday Americans, let's say if you're American, and you, you're seeing the world through different lenses uh, and so forth, if you could step back and open up space, as the great wisdom teachers uh, invoked us to do and pleaded with us to do, step back and open up into a global space. Dilate your global lens and heart and heart-mind. You will see certain patterns across the planet for the last 3,000 years, just to pick an arbitrary point. That is really astounding. Why didn't we see this before? Why couldn't we connect the dots across our great wisdom, spiritual teaching all across the planet? And that's really what I would like to just share and open up that space in the spirit of this meditation. A quick fast forward journey through the great wisdom on the planet, just samples to see that the diverse fonts or ways of thinking, whether it's Lao Tzu saying the Tao that is named is not the Tao, or in all of the uh, millennia of yoga wisdom, these great seers who saw into the depth of reality in this unified field, and they call it Om or Brahman, which is infinite spirit, infinite, the infinite energy of reality, and developing the technology and science and art of yoga. Most of us don't understand that yoga is not done from the ego-based, but it's all about letting the ego go and moving into the higher Om space, the space that Gandhi navigated and brought out into the political scene by tapping that power of consciousness. We're talking about what happens if you could leave the ego mind space where we, most of us live all our lives and die and can enter into this open, awakened space however you do it, by whatever means. Abraham faced that astounding moment in the call of God, Yahweh, love me with all you got, which means put me first. Why? The infinite source needs to be honored. And that's a fundamental point for humanity. And yet our everyday ego agendas, whatever it is, as dear as it is to us, we hold on to our ego identities and our agenda, what's important to me. So the battle in his soul of Abraham, do I listen to God and put God first? Or what I want, my, Abraham, my, my Isaac. That was a great global moment. It's a classic moment because the infinite field calls upon each of us in every moment, in every cell, and this is going to come out certainly with Howard Martin in terms of the heart math power uh, running through every cell in the body and the power of the heart uh, awakening and the, that intelligence. So the, 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 the struggle of Abraham and the heroic, it may seem cruel to say, I'm going to let go of Isaac. But symbolically, that's what all of the great teachers saw. You've got to sacrifice your story. You've got to sacrifice your ID and the way you've been processing yourself because you're privileging yourself and alleging that you have an independent existence, self-sustaining by yourself. And when the, you look at the spectrum of global wisdom, it seems to concur in very different ways that if you're in that ego stage of development or underdevelopment, and that you're privileging yourself and processing your world in the box and the screen before you, which is where most of us are in our cultural development, then you're suffering. Buddha his great awakening was to see that. He diagnosed that existence is suffering. Existence in that sense. Severed existence. And it's called samsara in the Indian tradition. Samsara is a condition, a deep ontological condition of being separated from unity and flow, from reality. And what is that reality for Buddha when he awakened? And the enlightened Buddha means the awakened one. He saw what others were seeing in his own way. He broke from the yoga tradition. He was a Hindu prince. He wanted to find out the answer himself of what he found in the Four Noble Truths. And they're called noble because, in a way, they're global across the planet. They're not, they're not local in, in a village. It's in the global village and beyond. The Four Noble Truths are everyday existence is suffering. And the cause is the identity of the person, the thinker, the, the ego person who alleges to be independent and separate and processing his or her life that way. You're cut off. And the second noble tr third noble truth is the axiom of choice. You don't have to use your mind that way. You can grow up to become a mindful, awakened being out of the cave. 
You can go into wisdom. Wisdom has to be lived, embodied in your life. And so Buddha's message, the third axiom, you have a choice. You don't have to use your mind in a way that traps you in the cave cut off situation of samsara, which is suffering. Not just suffering in terms of, say, poverty and illness, deeper than that, ontological suffering, existential suffering. Your meaning is not right. Your life, the values, your lights are not on. You're cut off. A human cannot flourish if he, she is cut off from the flow. You can't be severed from reality. That's severance is deep. I'm going to be putting a quick visual up so we can begin to picture as I give a few of these patterns. And the fourth noble truth is the technology. So how do you do this? And all of Buddha's wisdom is summed up in the fourth noble truth. You got to do rehab every day, 24 seven. Rehabilitate your mind. Why? Rehab, you do rehab when you're addicted. Yeah, that's egoholics. You, when you're ego addicted to your ego story and cut off, and that's who you are, it's hard to give that up. It's, that's, a, that's understated. It's terrifying to give it up. And most of us can't give it and won't give it up. And that's why humanity, 2,500 years later, is still under the sway and dominance of ego-based consciousness and thinking and cut off from flow. Whether it's yoga calling us into the yoga zone, the ohm zone, we still, we do our own ego yoga. I do it for my fitness, to get in state. My friends are doing it. Madonna's doing it. I want to be, I want to be. That's ego yoga is the opposite of yoga. Yoga is standing back and quieting the ego so that you can wake up and become like Mahatma, Mahatma, Atma, uh, Gandhi, who as a model for, for it. And then you live your life there. And that's where the power of consciousness flows, not from the ego base, which is cut off. If you can touch that deep space and stand in it, that's the power of one. That's Gandhi power, Mandela power, Martin Luther King power, Sophia is around the world. All, all of the, uh, the, the embodied feminine beings who have it in their life and in their way of holding energy on the planet, that's wisdom. So that's what Buddha was, 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 was teaching, how to rehabilitate and kick the habit. It's a deeply entrenched habit. And if you begin to look and dance, one of the astounding things you begin to see, wow, if in the biblical Judeo-Christian tradition, what is the deep condition of man that sets the agenda? We're born in sin. What is sin? It's a separation from connection and flow from divine energy. What is sin? Well, it's analogous to samsara at the deepest level. Why? Because it's cut off from being in the zone, in, in flow, in the Christ energy, in the Yahweh energy, that Kabbalah understands. So that whether you speak of sin as the deep condition of humanity that is our giving our major, if you're going to major as a human being, you're going to say, I've got to deal with the sin thing. How do you get out of sin? And you can't do it by your ego, even though you'd like to bootstrap. right? The ego can't by its own agenda and will, you've got to somehow let go of the ego to cross into the Christ space or the Yahweh space, following the laws of Moses and the model of Abraham, for example. So there's a, an echo across the planet that, wow, it's almost samsara. It's almost like analogous to sin. Let's call it sinsara. It's a global moment to connect them, right? So we can see the dots. So that when you hear these great teachers, all in their own great experiments and lab work for humanity, seeing a common deep source, that check it out, folks. Humanity growing up may enter a stage, which is maybe natural and pervasive, of egoing and objectifying your world. And I'm going to start drawing that up now. I've held you up on that long enough. So what I'm going to do in this meditation to build on this, to join me on this journey. I'm asking us to go on a journey through the wisdom of the planet, listen to the diverse voices, and see the profound, astounding disclosure that you hear echoed across the planet. And then we should be asking, it's almost a scandal. If that's right, if for over two, 3,000 years, just to pick an arbitrary point, our wisdom, enlightened, awakened beings have been teaching us that if you are lodged and stuck in an ego level of technology of mind, and that's how you're making yourself in your world, please notice that it fragments by its very nature. It disconnects. It
polarizes. It fragments. It breaks. It breaks you up inside. It breaks relations between people. It, it kills the bond that we want to see. It shuts down the heart that Howard is speaking about, the intelligence of the heart. And so what I want to do is to give a visual. I hope I can get up here. Can you still hear me? Oh, yeah. So I happen to bring a marker. And I think we're going to, oh, there it is. Uh, there's a camera that should hopefully put it so you can see it in the back. So what I've been suggesting as I try to create this PowerPoint is that there is a space that most of us live in. Here is a thinker, the thinking being, and the screen of your awareness where we process our world and our information. Scientists and logicians have given great scrutinizing attention to that box. Right? So the founding of logic in the European mind, Plato's uh, uh, Socrates and Aristotle, the founder of logic, understood that to think is to predicate. I don't want to get into fancy uh, words here, but to predicate is to put information together to make your world. And it's an axiom where every, whatever culture, you could be speaking Swahili or Hebrew or Chinese, it doesn't matter, whatever you're speaking, to think is to predicate is one. Thank you. And when you predicate, you're joining pieces, concepts, terms, words, information to make meaning, and it reflects your world. And when th the astounding point is that when you cross worlds, you shift your lens. If you're in the Chinese mind, and I'll draw this to just indicate the lens that, sh that's sh uh, that you're using in your mind that's allowing you to see certain things. And the lens issue is vital because if you, whatever lens you have in your mind, so if you're a Christian and you believe that Christ Jesus is the Savior and that is the truth, you're going to be seeing the world in a certain way. If you have a different lens, suppose you're a Lakota indigenous uh, person and seeing the world where nature is alive and the rivers and the mountains and the trees and all of this is sacred, your world is going to be predicated differently. What you can say and think in that world, you can't think in another world. In the world of the Big Bang, if that's what's going on in the story of the emergence of the cosmos, if Big Bang is right and not Genesis, if Genesis is saying that in the beginning is spirit which created the world, let there be light, and that's the biblical Big Bang, and the physicist is saying, no, there must be some energetic event of material energy, enormously, unbelievably ex expanding, and, and off the eons, and, and, and billions of years as the energy cooled off, life emerged, and then intelligent. That's a very different story than the biblical one. So when you switch your lens, what you can think in one, you can't even think in the other. If you go into the Hindu world, and you hear strange words like karma, and samsara, and dharma, and, uh, and uh, all of these words of moksha and yoga, you can't process that in a different language. You've got to somehow translate. But to translate, you've got to have a common ground. You've got to have common terms. Otherwise, if you, if you don't have common terms between worlds, as, and imagine how many worlds and worldviews there are. One can be that matter rules. Matter is the basis of all. The, the mind is just the brain. And you can understand the brain. Imagine a spiritually based language. In the beginning is spirit, and we are spirit, and mind rules over matter. That would be a very different worldview. So the materialist is speaking a very different language than the, the, the one who is seeing that spirit is the fundamental reality. So how you think and how you make sense of your world, how you put the meanings together. When Einstein shift from Newton, you could think in new ways in the space-time continuum. You can begin to think in a ways that new, that was Einstein's world. Why? He shifted the lens. He shifted the codes of the world to understand nature and phenomena in nature that allowed us to conceive and to think and to make sense in our language. So our worldview, our meaning, which is what we live for, that's why it's so deep. Your culture is your structure of meaning, how you interpret and see the world and make sense. And one word that philosophers introduce is called, it's called category mistake. When you join two pieces of concepts together that resist each other and don't make sense, you get nonsense. Suppose I start saying things like, seven is blue. You, you might chuckle, but seven is not a physical thing. Only physical things can have color. 
So if you put a color word, seven, an intangible, you're making a category mistake, and therefore sense or meaning breaks down. It's meaningless. And if you start to scramble the words, it says, wow, my culture has gave me a whole code of meaning. But when you cross cultures, meaning shifts. Your world shifts. Your reality shifts. Your habits of mind shift. And so you get very different worlds, and worlds are worlds apart. And in fact, if an ordinary American person is living in multiple worlds, you're going to have a different you when you say I. So I'm my biblical I. And I really believe that, that God created the universe. That biblical me. And I'm also a scientist. I'm a physicist. And so I really believe the Big Bang. That's a different. As a physicist, I have a different eye. I'm a civic American. And I, I learned as a civic American, I want an ecumenical space for democracy. I don't want to keep my religion in the back, but you know, keep out of the civic space. And that is creating deep tensions in my psyche because my religion is saying, breathe and love God in every moment. Don't leave it out of your political life. So now what do I do? And so stresses begin to develop across these personality alternative IDs that we have. They're different worlds. So if worlds are broken apart and I'm living them, then my bond is broken. I'm having multiple personalities. I am, of course, seeing my psychotherapist and try and solve this problem, and she's making it worse because she's saying she's young in and she's saying, I've got a male and a female in me. Anima and the animas. And I'm saying, oh, now I'm finished. I have to, I have to come to terms with the female. You know, but I, I have a tree-hugging friend who does yoga, so I'm chanting home, and that's not helping me very much. And this is, this is where we live, you know? Even if you do feng shui on top of that and move your furniture around and move the chi energy, you're in trouble. Your personality keeps dividing. So where's the integrity? Where's the bond? Where's the healing of the being? You're not even a whole being. This is just you in your own inner psyche. Normal schizophrenia, right? You, 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 you don't have deep dialogue within your soul. So it takes literacy of crossing worlds and we're not educated sufficiently. How do we recognize the codes across our worldviews and become literate and expert in dancing across worlds. And to do that, you've got to go into a deeper space. And that's really what I'm trying to, to, to indicate in this very brief review, is that our great visionaries who said, look, reality is not down here or in the box. It's not what the ego sees through its limited lens. There's a deep field, an infinite field. They all seem to concur, whatever name you call it. So if you call it Tao, in the Chinese, Lao Tzu, the great genius, the spiritual, was saying, reality is Tao, Qi energy. And the Tao that is name is not the Tao. You can't predicate the Tao. This infinite space is an infinite script. It's an infinite field. It's a field of reality. And we come out of that. You can't step outside of it. We are of it. That's where the bond emerges. That's when the heart lights up rather than the ego-based heart and the, the form of life. Your life is your as good as your lens. And one of the astounding axioms you begin to see in the pattern across the planet is, wow, we are as we mind. The minding lens and technology we use, how we use our mind, shapes our world and our reality. So my reality, my being, I am as I mind. If you're ego mind, you have an ego life. If you integral holistic mind in this field, and that's what the great wisdom teachers are saying, there's a higher script. You don't downscript this here. That violates and breaks the scripts and keeps you severed. This line is the separation from the flow of that field. So there are two fields. With all of the diverse worlds in the ego-based mind in this space, this diversity of worlds are still cut off whether it be even religion. If I'm religious here in this space, my religious world is cutting me off from the infinite, from the divine space, according to our great teachers. The Om view of the meditators who saw out of the ego mind and lens into this deep, infinite space, what, do you, what is it called in the yoga space? Om. So what is the strategy for being a human? Don't predicate silent predication. The first axiom of Patanjali, the great Yoga Sutra, is yoga is the quieting of ego mind. A 
and it's through meditation as an alternative technology of consciousness that whatever you understand of meditation it is the technology that upscripts your mind into an integral, holistic, dialogue form of flow. That's where you reach communion of the mind and in integration. That's where you begin to sol solve the fragmentation and to begin to heal and become a whole person. Mind, body, spirit. You can't do it here in the box. You can't use this technology. I don't have enough time on this occasion. In the past, I've done that some more to say, why is it that these great teachings across the planet we're seeing that if you're using this, and I use single strokes to mark this space, just because it was so vital to see, I need to know then when I'm in this ego-based calculus of the mind, if this is so damaging to my well-being and flourishing, I better, I better find a way to bring it out. And that's what philosophers and logicians do. A logician tries to bring the font of the mind out in the open so you can get clarity and lucidity in your mind. A good script is a good teacher. If you've got a corrupted script that fragments everything it touches and breaks you from flow, then that script is causing a, an inner disaster to the quality of your life and your flourishing. And that is what's one of the astounding disclosures as you keep going across the planet, whether it's the Tao or the Om or Buddha's Shunyata. Buddha called this space emptiness. He didn't want to use any words. When you wake up and go into awakened space, a mindfulness, which is it, to be mindful is to be in the field, not talking about it. You're talking about it. Here you are it. You are it. You're surfing it. You're in the place. And what is that place of shunyata, which is called emptiness? Shunya means zero in Sanskrit. Shunyata is zero-ish rather than one-ish. Because when you one yourself, when you make yourself whatever your story, I hope you notice that we're, you're not just outside of the box, you're inside the box because that's the story you've developed for yourself. If you sit down to have coffee with someone and say, tell me about yourself, what do you do? You start to predicate. Well, I'm American, I came for this, I'm a student at Haverford College, or I'm a father. And you start giving your predicate. That's who you are, your bundle of predications. And Buddha's great insight says, no, you're not, you're much more. If you put yourself in the box and make yourself an object, the, the thinker, who is a thinking subject, is having an object. And every one you think about with your lens, you're making an object. Imagine what that means. If I'm objectifying you from my lens, my limited lens, and that's what I see you as, and that's all you are, then I'm violating you. To lens the other person is to slash the person, is to reduce him or her. And all of our great moral teachers understood Never objectify a human being. Never treat yourself as an object or another. Why? Because entities, objects, beings in the box are cut off from our true humanity. So then if that's the hot spot to be, how can I say I am in this space? How do I say I am in the Om space or the Tao or the Buddha space or the Christ space? You could see that I used double parentheses to mark the crossing. I began to see over decades of teaching that it was vital for humanity to bring into the open the conflated script between this form of speech and mind and life and the ego-based form. There are two dimensions. <clears throat> so to go into the Ohm zone is a, is a very profound shift. That we're talking about the great shift for humanity. What is the shift? I'm suggesting it's a shift from this single bracket the way I call it, mental space and life, separation and fragmentation, into the double parentheses space <coughs> of being in the zone. That's where you wake up. This is where moral consciousness is. Why? Because when I say I am, if you could say I am, with this I, not this space, this is a huge shift to a deeper space. And if you've read Descartes' meditation, for example, when Descartes, a just mathematical genius and philosophical genius, in his Meditations on First Philosophy is the title of his book. What is first philosophy? The, the philosophy that attempts to get to what is primal and first. And what Descartes found, as you know, is that when he began to question all of his beliefs, and this is where your beliefs are, your mental space. A belief is uh, lights are on, rain is falling, spring is coming. These are all beliefs. I am hungry, I am thirsty, I am depressed. 
right? These, all of your inner mental states and outer facts, they're all here. That's where your beliefs and judgments are and your intentions, your ego-based intentions. I want to be rich. I want to be happy. I want to be liberated, spoken from the ego, is still a predication intention. But if somehow these teachers are right and you can cross and upscale into this space, be in the zone, when an athlete is in the zone and she is running on that glorious fall day when she is just the running, it's not I am running, it's running. That's a powerful word, to be the running. When Descartes therefore saw that every belief could be, could be wrong, why? Because the ego-based space is not grounded. It's not in the foundation, in the endowment, in the source of all the flow of meaning. How do you get the flow? You have to go into the script. What do you mean? Well, the infinite force is infinite script. That's why the biblical, in the beginning, is the word. Tao is the word. Om is the word. Why the word? I thought the word was here. That's where every day, when I say the word red, I use the word red to refer to something out in the world. Or I say, I run. I use the word run to run, to describe, to ascribe. To describe is to ascribe and to predicate. Whereas if you could just be the running, when that athlete is, she is the running in the fall, flowing with the ecology in an integral way, you need a higher script to do it. And that's really what I wanted to bring out. That, to me, is one of the greatest astounding disclosures of the wisdom of the planet. So when Jesus is trying to upscript, and his disciples are here, and he's saying weird things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life, for example. How can you say that? What is it? A truth is a sentence that describes reality. If you say the pen is black, the tr sentence, the pen is black, is true if the pen is black. That's what truth is. It's a true sentence. It's a true predication. And Jesus is saying wrong. Because if he's the logos in the flesh, logos is a Greek word, logos, for the source of the mind, of reason, of speech. All of the logic comes out of logos. And logos is Sophia. So the Greek tradition is logos Sophia, which is their word for the infinite force that funds all mind and script and life. And if the logos is in the flesh, then the flesh is here. So that the Christ voice is a voice calling into the double parentheses space. And all the miracles are miracles of shift, the upshift, the resurrection. When he says the wage of sin is death and the gift of life, the gift of God is life, that's what it means. Light and life is in this space. So the scripture embodied in the life of Jesus, for example, I'm just using examples here, is to recognize the script of the double parenthesis space. So the rites of passage, like the taking of the sacrament, when you break the bread. If you take bread here, single bracket, and you see, this is my body. And you drink this wine, and you really, not ego drink it, but Christ drink it. The sacrament calls us in to understand this wine is the blood of Logos. So that the essence of the sacrifice there and there's always sacrifice involved. That's what Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is saying to Arjuna, who's a, an, a warrior, a martial artist who's broken down in the battle, a fratricidal war, because <clears throat> it's going to split and polarize. And again, I'd love to follow that in the dialogue at the end. Why is it that these genius teachings recognize that if you're using the ego-based calculus of the mind, it splits everything it touches? because it is fundamentally split off, and every word is given its own signature independently. But the world is in flow, it's in the bond. The world, reality, I can put this pen here, and we treat it like, you know, it's a pen, it's a piece of plastic. You know, we are predicated. We treat ourselves that way too. Do I dare raise this pen into that space? This is an experiment, imagine what that is. Because in this field, everything is interconnected. And every point, because it's the infinite field, whatever name you use, Om, Shunyata, Brahman, Yahweh, Allah, the unified field of physics, whatever name you use, it's an infinite field. And if you think that through in an elementary way, astounding axioms are clear. Because if the field 
And Lynn has written a book called The Field, beautiful book. If the field is for real and it's infinite, and why should it be infinite? Because it cannot be bounded. And if it is infinite, there's no other. Why? Because that's what infinite means. There couldn't be something outside of it because then it would be delimited, and it would be limited, and therefore finitized, and therefore not finite. So the logic of the infinite means it's one. Well, how one is it? Well, not one in the ego sense of one, but one in an infinite sense. The infinite is infinite unity. What's up with that? Well, if it's infinite unity, it doesn't have to squelch diversity. It celebrates it. So that means every point in this field is a marvelous point, even a grain of sand. That's a basic axiom. Every speck in the field of the infinite, whether you call it Om or Yahweh or Christ or Buddha, emptiness, is simple science. You can't break a piece of the infinite off and not have the infinite. It replicates itself. That means there's a grain, just as Blake, the poet, says, there's infinity in a grain of sand. Or when it's said that if you had faith, not faith is not here from the ego. Faith is awakened awareness. And if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, a pound point, you can move mountains, Gandhi. Satya power, truth force, is here. So when you be the truth, you're tapping the field. When you're in the field, you're in the bonding. And when you're in the bonding, you're empowered. And you can flourish. So the astounding simple truth, according to global wisdom, is when you are, or if you are cut off from source, you're going to suffer in the deepest way. You can't flourish. And therefore, you're going to be in your midlife crisis all your life. You can have your midlife crisis, which is record. Midlife crisis is the implosion of an ego-based life. So when Descartes, picking up that point, I'm juggling, when Descartes said, I am, he, when he saw he could doubt everything in his life, even mathematics, 2 plus 2 equals 4, could be wrong. Why? Because he was judging it and therefore interpreting it. And if you're interpreting it and judging it, you could be mistaken. And if there's a demon deceiving your mind, and he says, suppose, what if there's a demon deceiving me to make me believe that that predication is true when it's not? Then I'm in trouble. In fact, what if I am deceiving myself? What if the e demon of deception is in my mind? He, he, he wondered. And Freud, of course, knew that the unconscious mind can be deceiving us. And we might be having one narrative in the so consciously, but unconsciously I'm angry. I'm in passive-aggressive behavior. And a deep, deeper unconscious is ruling me. Well, that's what Descartes is talking about. What if there's a deceiver within me? I'm stuck. So he, he said, I'm going to let this go. This is a huge piece of global wisdom. And then he said, I am. And we missed it. Because when you say anything, you're going to say it here, naturally. But the whole point was he saw, I am. And if you listen to his words, it was a turning point for Europe, potentially. But it took 200 years later before Hustrow picked up on it and say, uh-oh, he wasn't here. He was opening up a deeper lens when he said, I am. Because what he did was strip down, he did the yoga thing. He was meditating, unfortunately. When he said, it's called Descartes Meditations, not Predications. And so when he said, I am, he stepped out of the box as a great pioneering moment for, for Europe. And remember, this is a mathematical genius, founding analytical geometry and a philosophical genius. And he said, I am. He says, what am I? I don't know. But that I am is clear. Let me proceed with great caution, not to mistake myself for something else. And so the whole meditation falls from that point. And the first thing he discovered in the I am is, uh-oh, if I am my thinking, like the runner in the zone, I am thinking. He wasn't saying I am thinking as a predication, because the demon would get him. So to defeat the demon of doubt, he had to go into from the disconnection between the thinker and the object, he had to go into deep self-connection with himself. He touched his deep self. He bonded at that moment. And so when Descartes said, I am, he realized there was a self that you couldn't put words on. Like the Tao that is named is not the Tao. The I am is deeper than your predication story. All the wisdom of the planet says, back off from lodging and wedging yourself into that space because it's going to hurt. It's, that's what Buddha said, suffering. Why? Because you're cut off from flow. 
<clears throat> so there are many ways of wording this. That there, there are strategies for going from the severed place into the place where you're in the deep bond, where your heart and heart intelligence awakens. And this is really why I'm so excited to have uh, Lynn and Howard, each in their brilliant ways and pioneering ways, attempting to open up the heart intelligence, Howard is, and Lynn's book, The Field, and The Intention Experiment, and The Bond, uh, are really realizing there's a deeper science emerging now where you realize the space between, the I, the thou space, that's what Descartes discovered. This is messy. Let me start. Let me, next slide, please. So the picture that I gave you, forget it. Forget everything I say so far. I'm going to start over. Let's start over now with what's the basic field. Whatever name. Again, Om, Tao, Yahweh, Logosophia, Allah, the unified field of science. Whatever name you use, right? I use Logosophia because I'm a logician. I could have said Om Sophia. Right, I could have said Tao, I could have said many words, but I'm just leaving it open because it's infinite. And therefore it has infinite possibilities. So that's the field we're in. You can breathe now. Because any ego story I have, even though I have this cut, this sin cut, or samsara, this separance, if I, even if I fall into this place where my separated ego is going, you can only ego, this is how you should write it, the ego needs the field. This is how you should write your name. The single bracket would say whatever story I'm locally carrying, even complex stories, is funded by the field. That's a basic axiom of global wisdom. You can never step outside of the infinite field. No one, no story, no discipline, no script can step outside of the infinite field. Furthermore, the infinite field is funding every iota in every moment in order to say I and presume that I'm a separate existing being in my own right, which is a big arrogant ontological arrogance, you couldn't even say I without the funding of, of, the, of the infinite field. Why? Because the infinite field is relational flow. The ego sphere is disconnected. Every word is separately rendered, and therefore you're piling up all of those separate predications on yourself, your mind and your body. And if you think about it, that's the mind-body problem. The mind-body problem is an ego-based problem that is seeing that the mind is one fundamental phase of my life and my body is another. My body is in space and time, my mind and consciousness, when I'm doing mathematics, as Plato saw, I can go out of my body into my rational space. So if rational space is outside of space and time, and that is my mind and my body, there's a deep disconnect. Just as one example. But then all of the words, space, and time, and cause, and substance, and color, and figure, and texture, and motion. And this pen is having all color, figure, texture, motion, and so forth. And we treat it just like a piece of plastic and throw it away. But if you put it, and dare to put it into the infinite field, and check out the pen, if you can handle it, it'll be mind-boggling. So I say to my students, imagine if this pen were picked up on Mars and CNN was watching through the Explorer. And people would just gasp and say, oh my God, we're in trouble. Check it out, there's a pen on Mars. You realize, it'll be headline news. Why? Because the pen encodes the entire information of all evolution in it. It's huge. Language, intelligence, culture, literacy, on and on, science, technology. It's all in this one little thing you picked up. Well then, if, you, if that's true, if when you cross this line from the ego sphere into the Sophia logosphere, the infinite space, if everything here is touching everything else as these geniuses allege, so that every point, including each of us, is a power point in this field. And because it's infinite, it's infinitely open and diverse, boundless infinite diversity. You don't lose your individuality. Think of the word individual. Individual is divided. Individual means not divided. The ego thinks he, she is individual. I, I'm an individual because I got my own predication story. I got my ID. I got my predicates, and you don't. I mean, I'm not you, right? That's, uh, you're going to see from Lynn Clear that you're, you're that pushing the other away. Right? 
When you go into this space deeper than your predications, it divides you into the integral space, as Descartes was discovering. You are interconnected, you're in the zone. And Buddha saw, so therefore, you are more than any bundle of information. You are interconnectivity. What do you discover then? The point I'm making about Descartes, that the, when he discovered the I am, he realized right away that if I am a thinking and I can stop thinking, I might stop being. So something else is here holding me. What could this be? Could I be deceiving myself? And he does a third meditation and he says, oh my God, the idea of infinite being is infinite being. He discovered it. He discovered that in this space, the idea, not like an idea here. These ideas are just weak ideas because they're in the box and they picture something outside. But when you go into the ideas here, like the, in the beginning is the infinite script, if you can touch that, you begin to see that the idea of infinite being is infinite being. Just as the idea of me is me, I am. My thinking is me. I am my minding. Right? He got that. So that he be, therefore discovered the I thou, the infinite thou is holding me with me. And that's where the rational light comes from. That's what he got through to. And we missed it because we were putting him back in the box as we do with all of our teachers. The only script and literacy we know is the predication script. And despite the ring of this truth of to the high and the call to the language of Sophia and to Logos, to the grammar of Buddha, of Lao Tzu, and all of these across the planet, we keep downscripting. So the question, is scripture here? Do we have a grammar for scripture? And if we do, as Jesus was calling his disciples right, to, to this script, and they would say, you know, unless you die, you won't be born. You know, do I have to enter my mother's womb again? He said, no, no, no. For those who have ears, let them hear. He got a little impatient. Jesus did. Because he said, you know, for those who have ears, well, I wish he could have said, yeah, this is how you get your ears, you know, the third eye, the, you know, the first ear. How do you open your ears to script and gain the literacy? This, so I hope you're getting the, the, uh, the, the, the pattern. What I'm suggesting is that the, the, the self is not a separate atom by itself, and Lynn brings this up beautifully, but the self is a dialogue self, I thou. The other is in me already. That's the connectivity. That's a huge piece of news, if it's true. Because I wanted my space. I even have my space account. I want my space. That's the individual. But you know, my space is thy space. The I and the other, the I thou. That's Buber saw that. There's I it and I thou. The thou meaning the other. And we want to push the other away, but the genius is no. Because of interconnecti infinite interconnectivity, the other is within you and yet you're separate and together. Not codependency, but co-interdependency. And so if that's true, then to tend to myself is to tend to the other. This is the place of the bond. Let me clean this up a little bit. And this is my third and final slide. So back into this place where we can breathe, into the infinite field. And so, if every, any point now that you take in that, it's uh, as uh, Greg Braden was bringing out, it's fractal. The metaphor of fractal, it means that it connects with everything else boundlessly. So that anything you take from the everyday world and place in that space, that's why our teachings have said, for example, the Quaker tradition here at Haverford, the Quakers who understood this deeper space and said, I, you don't need a priest or a uh, minister to mediate with God, God is right here. So strip down the walls, folks, and let's meet together and face each other in the square of the, of the Haverford Quaker meeting hall. And let's sit in the silence. That's why we began in silence. This is the place of silence. And silence is a space between. So in music, when Seth is playing music, between those notes is infinite silence between the notes that holds the notes together to make music. That's the infinite field in every moment of silence. That's why you're being here and holding the space that you are. Each of you, I see you as sitting here and holding a PowerPoint, which is boundless in its power. And that's the power of consciousness. That's the awakened heart mind, not the ego mind. But the awakened mind is the heart mind, the whole being. Your whole being is part of that field. <clears throat> so th this is the I-thou point then, is that 
the other. There are two technologies of being a human, the one in which the eye is separated from the object in the box, and we do all of our world making in the box, and our experience, we box it, we package it, or out of the box, interrelation. So the I and the other are always interconnected. And our moral teachers were saying, this is where you become a moral being. Here you objectify yourself and the other with the technology of your consciousness, and here you open your space to the other and let it show. Let it show up to you, and you don't put your lens on it. Right? That's where dialogue place, takes place. That is the bond of dialogue. Dialogos. When you're in the logos, what is broken here and polarized, even broken worlds and 9-11s, can go deeper into the source where they, whence they arise. That is a space of I and thou. And that is a space of bonding and the opening of the heart-mind. I thank you very much for your attention. May I have a program a moment, please, Bart? My program was taken away. Thank you. Well, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce Lynn McTaggart. You just had a moment, uh, you know, of hearing her voice. And I, you know, you have a paragraph there to understand that uh, she is a presence on the planet as a, a, a voice. Uh, in the media, uh, in terms of a revolutionary frontier of health and holistic health. And her book, uh, The Intention Experiment, is, is widely acclaimed and translated in many languages. And her book, The Field, and now the appearance of the bond connecting on this, through the space between. And in a way, what I've been trying to show in terms of the collective wisdom of the planet is that to go into that deep space is a space where it's the bond occurs. And when you stay in the ego space, the alienation and separations and the pathological space uh, emerges. So we're going to listen to, uh, uh, please welcome Lynn McTaggart as she speaks on the theme of her book. Lynn, welcome. <laughs> 